joining us. I'm Steve Clemens, editor at large of The Atlantic, and it is a great pleasure to have so many of us, uh, so many of you with us today uh, in a program that we are, we're starting now uh, uh, and we'll go. We'll have every 20 to 30 minutes the, the biggest newsmakers and, and provocateurs in the business. It's going to be very, very fast paced, including this great lunch. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Arab Spring, media in the Arab Spring, issues in the Arab Spring with a really dynamic, fantastic panel. Uh, a very good friend of mine who is the Bureau Chief for the Americas uh, of Al Jazeera, Amjad Atala, uh, was going to moderate this but has been called out of the country uh, on urgent business. And Patty Colhane, whom we all know from watching as Al Jazeera English has boomed to the ratings as we watch these dynamic convulsions, uh, has, has agreed to step in. Patty, of course, is the White House correspondent for Al Jazeera. So, uh, Patty, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, and I want to thank all of these are all good friends Marwan, uh, Anne Marie Slaughter, uh, and Steve Adler of Thomson Reuters, editor in chief, for doing this. But you go ahead and introduce as you will. But thank you all very much. Thanks, Steve. And I hope it's not a reflection on how you feel about Apple's new launch that you threw your phone. Don't, don't forget that. Uh, Very resilient. <laughs> not mine. Amjad wanted me to tell everyone that he's such a huge fan of Steve. He feels very bad that he can't be here. It was a family emergency, so he had to fly out of the country. And when your boss says, hey, can you do this? Here we are. I want to introduce our panel, though. Steve Adler has been the editor-in-chief of Reuters News since February of 2011 and previously worked as editor-in-chief of Business Week. He was also the deputy man managing editor of the Wall Street Journal, where the investigative reporting teams he managed won three Pulitzer Prizes. Very impressive resume. And then we have uh, Marwan Mouasher, is the vice president of the Carnegie Endowment, is in charge of their Middle East program. He's also the former foreign minister of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And Anne Marie Slaughter is a professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton University. She was the first female director of policy planning at the U U.S. Uh, State Department, which I just have such a hard time believing. But uh, she's also the former dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, correspondent for The Atlantic writes notes from the foreign policy frontier and is a foreign policy curator on Twitter at Slaughter AM. All right, welcome everyone. So we're here to talk about the Arab Spring, and my first question, I think, hasn't really been established, is what spurred on the Arab Spring? I've heard all of this talk about social media. I don't know if I necessarily buy it. Steve, what do you think started it? Well, you know, I, I don't credit social media with the uh, reasons for what happened, but it was, it was certainly a facilitator. Um, I, I think we're seeing the ability of citizen journalists and social media to have an effect around the world that's quite different. And we in more traditional media at, at Reuters um, are to some degree consumers of that social media. So we're looking at the citizen journalism, we're looking at the videos, we're looking at the Twitter and, um, and reacting to that. But uh, I'm less an expert on what the causes were, but I, I do think that, um, that social media and um, the role of the, the media generally has been a, has sped up the process of, uh, of communication, has spread it within the Arab world in a very interesting way. Um, and the technology does matter. It, it, it's not a secondary issue, but the underlying causes are certainly far deeper than the fact that people got, got together through social media. Marwan, do you want to weigh in on this? No, I, I, I agree with uh, what Steve said. I think uh, social media was a facilitator. I would also credit, uh, not because you're here, but channel uh, TV stations like Al Jazeera, who truly played a crucial role, one in showing other Arab countries what is going on and what is possible in other Arab countries, and two, in, in, in actually preventing things from happening. I mean, the, the Hama killings in Syria of, of, of 1982 would not be repeated in 2011. Yes, we have... 3,000 people killed already, but still, I think people are still aware of the power of TV and what they could not do today that uh, they could do 30 years ago. Yeah. So the, the real drivers, of course, are the people in the streets who are willing to face bullets, uh, finally to uh, demand change. Those movements have been growing, uh, but 
and, and ultimately we can't call them f Facebook revolutions or Twitter revolutions. They are social and political revolutions driven by demographics, by young people who've had enough, but also by organization. I don't think we, we give enough credit to groups like Atpour from Serbia who have been working with these activists for months and months on how you turn a Facebook page into a street demonstration that lasts. It's not as easy easy as calling for one. And in fact, if you're reading uh, what's happening with Occupy Wall Street and other similar movements, you will see that people from Tunisia and Egypt uh, who are actually talking to American organizers to tell them what worked and what didn't. So there's a layer there of political activism and organization that is an important part of this. So I think part of the problem when, it, when people give it the social media revolution characterization, it makes it seem as if, oh, the revolutions happened very quickly, and the next step's going to happen very quickly, because it did play out on television, it played out on Al Jazeera, and thanks for the plug. Uh, so what does success look like, and when will we see it? Take Marwan. Well, first of all, I think there has been a romantic notion, uh, maybe in this town and in the West in general, that the Arab Spring, in fact, this is a Western uh, name given to the uprisings, is going to result overnight in democratic cultures and, and countries. That's not going to happen. Uh, I'm, I remain uh, hugely optimistic over the long term, but we should not expect that countries uh, which have been governed by autocrats and which had no strong civil society organizations or strong political parties are somehow going to make a smooth transition from autocracy to democracy in a matter of months and years. Mistakes are going to take place, are going to happen both on the political and economic front. Uh, this is a process that I think will be measured in decades rather than in months and years. But at the end of the road, I remain optimistic that people who have finally went to the street are not going to uh, 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 be satisfied with anything less than pluralistic societies. It's just not a linear process and not a smooth one. Uh, I, I agree with that. The, the immediate question in terms of success, you also have to look at different stages. So I'd say right now, success is nonviolent resistance succeeding in accomplishing meaningful political change. We've seen that in Tunisia and Egypt, although that change is still happening. But of course, in Libya, it's taken violent resistance. And the question for us now is whether or not, not for us, but for the, the people on the streets in Syria and Yemen, whether nonviolent resistance will work or whether that actually turns into armed resistance and civil war. Just, just one, one comment on the, uh, the social media aspect of this. I mean, w one thing that's clear from social media and the generation that practices it is it's quite anti-elite and it's quite anti-hierarchical. So you're dealing with a, a Facebook generation that's used to a very flat structure um, that's thinking differently, thinking in communities. It's not necessarily a medium that produces solutions, but it's a medium that's very dissatisfied with power structures, with hierarchies. You see that with the Occupy Wall Street. Um, you see it in a much, obviously, deeper way in the Middle East. And I think that ends up having consequences towards what happens afterwards, because this isn't a generation that will simply uh, reenact another set of elites. You know, in many ways, we're all sort of sitting back and watching this happen. And you just made a very important distinction between what's happening in Egypt and Tunisia and what we were seeing in Libya and in Syria and in Bahrain, going from nonviolent protests to obviously it's going to be, it's becoming very violent. Is there anything anyone can do to try and turn it back, to, to turn it to the Egypt-Tunisia model? Or is it going to have to be like Libya? Would you like to see NATO intervention? <laughs> no. Uh, I don't want to see NATO intervention, and I don't think anybody on the ground in Syria, there are people calling for protection, but there are equal numbers of people uh, who think that would be disastrous. The real, when you say is there anything that can be done? The question is less for the United States and NATO and more for the countries of the region. It's going to be Turkey as much as anything else that is going to decide whether you can put the kind of pressure on the Syrian government 
to force it to step down or to create an alternative uh, with a different government, with a, with a di shifting alliance of the, the Syrian business class that could still save, create a, a, a successful transition uh, with nonviolent resistance. But that's not going to be about the U.S. or NATO, and as of yesterday, it's not going to be about the U.N. It's much more, I think, the countries in the region, and Turkey is the leading one. I would add to that uh, also the role of Arab states. I think Libya was possible only after an Arab League decision that made it possible for a Security Council decision. And I think in a place like Syria, in the end, the Arabs will need to act. Uh, uh, th there has been a huge shift already in public opinion in the Arab world as well as among Arab governments regarding Syria. I mean, from a place where people were willing to give Syria the benefit of the doubt in order to do reforms. Now, I think just about everybody, including Arab countries, understand that this is over, that the Syrian regime is not interested in reform, that for them this is a zero-sum game. Any, you know, any compromises that they give will come at their own expense and their own uh, ability to rule. And therefore, I think that with time, unfortunately, this is going to take time in the Syrian case, I would give it between six months to a year. But at the end, no one in the region will be able to tolerate 30 people being killed every single day. And the Arabs will have to move. And there, I think, I would, uh, given the vacuum in the Arab world today, probably uh, the Saudis will have to take the lead on this. Or the protesters back down. Is that I don't, the protesters are dead men walking right now. They're not, uh, they understand that if they go back home, they're dead. So I don't, I don't expect the protesters in Syria to, 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 to back down. It is going to be bloody. This is a regime, as I said, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, is 10 percent of the population ruling over the other 90 percent. For them, reform means their own death sentence. So they're not going to uh, be engaged in any serious reform process. It's going to uh, need somebody to, to step in. NATO is out, I agree. I don't see any possibility of NATO or any Western country stepping in. And therefore, there is a lot of responsibility that falls upon countries in the region like Turkey, but also like Saudi Arabia. Well, I saw Erdogan speak last weekend in New York, and he said he's going to take more steps, more sanctions soon. Is that, what's the answer? How do, is there any way to avoid the six months of just absolute carnage that you've described. Sanctions are not what will do it. I mean, uh, when people are drowning, they don't care if, uh, you know, they get wet, basically. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to do it. Uh, it's going to take a lot more than sanctions to uh, force the regime out. One possible scenario is, uh, you know, uh, uh, an internal job from inside the regime, an Alawite general uh, who uh, uh, s thinks enough is enough and we need a solution to do this. Uh, but I do think that the Arab League uh, needs to also take a stronger position on what is going on in Syria than uh, what they are doing now. And you're saying that's going to take time? Unfortunately, I think so. I, it, the one thing I would add there is it, it is possible also that Turkey would move to create more of a protected buffer zone between Syria and Turkey where the opposition can gather, can organize, uh, and, and create more pressure that way in addition to, to sanctions. I don't see Turkish direct military action against Syria, but I think Turkey is making clear that it is willing to host the opposition, it is willing to create space for them, and it will put as much pressure on to try to force an internal shift as possible. Do you see signs that that's going to happen? I know that's been talked about a lot in Washington, but is it being talked about over there? From well, your... so one of the questions is whether Erdogan is, is boxing himself in, right? He is taking a more and more visible position. If sanctions don't work, we know a lot about this in the West, you, then you have to have, you have to do something else. You, your credibility is increasingly on the line. Okay. Let's talk about, since we're in Washington, the U.S. response to the Arab Spring, and I'm going to keep using that term because it's, I think, the easiest way to just explain it. I know the whole world was taken aback. I don't think there were very many people who said this is going to happen and then we're going to see this cascading effect. Grade for me, if you would, quickly, how the Obama administration handled it. Steve, if you want to tackle it from a media perspective, did they get their message out? Um, 
I, I don't think I'm in a position as I, I wanted uh, to grade the administration in part because uh, this sounds like a digression and you'll go back to your question. But th there's a lot of different voices in this type of event. And some of the voices are, um, are ad advocacy voices and that's appropriate. But what I found very interesting is the, the useful mix of a combination of a neutral player, and, and Reuters has been in the Middle East for since 1865, we've got 200 people there, and we're there to, to listen to both sides, to be a neutral voice, to try to get information out, and not to, be in a, not to play an advocacy role. So we're near, neither cheering nor booing when things are happening, we're trying to keep contact with both sides, which, is, which explains the reason why I'm not going to grade uh, the Obama administration. There is a role in what's going on there for, for people who are using social media as part of you know revolutions, and I think there's a very important role in terms of transparency and in terms of getting information out to people like in this room to uh, to have people there who are doing the traditional journalistic role of being neutral. So for that reason, I pass. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, but you, were your journalists able? Your journalists there were there. Were they able? Were they hearing from people on the street about how they felt the Obama administration was handling it? You know, I mean, the interesting thing about covering uh, the, the Middle East is, first of all, how dangerous it is. So we're spending a lot of time, uh, you know, we, we had our four correspondents in Syria were detained, they were all expelled. So, so there isn't, uh, you know, as much conversation going on about the Obama administration as trying to, you know, cover what's going on, stay safe, stop from getting kicked out of the country, uh, have relations with both sides, have an exit strategy when the hotel you're in gets, uh, you know, gets attacked and gets bombed. So I, I don't think it's been a major focus uh, of ours as, as, as to you know what the opinion on the street is. Also, being a global organization, we're not you know focusing that much when we're in the Middle East on what the Obama administration is doing. See, because I'm the White House correspondent, I might have a cute, skewed perspective, but I know during our coverage, every time something happened in any one of these countries, they instantly asked, "What's the Obama administration?" So I'll take the question to you too. Can you grade the president? You go ahead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look. If the question is, do people, what do people think of the U.S. Uh, sort of position on the Arab Spring back uh, in the region, frankly, I don't think it's, uh, it weighs heavily on anybody's mind. I mean, this is not about America, what, what is going on in the Middle East. This is about people uh, that uh, want uh, a wider say in the decision-making process of their own countries. America is not something that they uh, thought much about, and I don't see a strong role for the United States a strong direct role in the Arab Spring. What I do see a role in, uh, as the United States attempts to move away from its past policies of basically prioritizing stability over reform into a policy that, uh, that emphasizes stability through reform, uh, the one thing that the United States can do, frankly, that, that, that uh, that, uh, that it at least partly controls is movement on the Arab-Israeli conflict. I know this is not directly related to the, Arab to the Arab uprisings, but it's something that will help the Arab uprisings and help America's credibility in the region a great deal. Because in this new atmosphere, since January, America cannot keep telling Arabs that if you are Egyptians or Libyans or Syrians yearning for freedom, we will walk down that road with you, and if you're Palestinians yearning for freedom, we might actually erect roadblocks for you. That's not going to be an argument that will, you know, that will go well in Arab minds. This is a new region in, in the Middle East. It's a region in flux. It will take, as I said, decades before things stabilize. The one thing that the U.S. can truly help in is affect a direct and, and, and quick resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict. It will help the Arab-Israeli conflict, and it will help the Arab uprisings. If that does not happen, I am afraid that, one, we will not see peace for a very long time, and two, uh, the Arab public's perception of the United States will only go south. Well, if you, uh, before I let you answer that, there's a, a Zogby poll out. President Obama's approval rating in most of the Middle East is 10% or less. President Bush, at the end of his term, had higher approval ratings in many of these countries. And they might not think about it on the street, the Arab street, but they're thinking about it in Washington. It matters to this country. It, well, if it should matter. Uh, you know, President Obama basically raised expectations a great deal uh, 
in Cairo when he you know, gave an extremely forthcoming speech about the need to work with the region and frankly did nothing after that. I mean, the, the Mitchell years unfortunately were three wasted years in which we were wasting, you know, uh, following a mirage of, uh, of a negotiations process that has been not going anywhere for the last 10 years and expecting things to happen. I'm always reminded of the Einsteins uh, saying, you know, insanity is doing uh, things over and over, same thing over and over again and expecting different results. The time has come to solve this conflict uh, and not to engage in uh, a wasted negotiations process, uh, in, in, in my view. So yes, uh, uh, the president's popularity rating in the Middle East is way down, frankly, partly because of his own doing. He raised expectations a great deal. He talked about Palestine being admitted last year to the United Nations, and then this year, you know, is threatening a veto. Uh, he, has, he has not helped his own case. But what I'm saying is, if the United States is truly serious about not just the president's image in the Middle East, but the U.S. image in the, U in the Middle East, it needs to internalize the fact that they are dealing today with a vastly different Arab world than before January of this year. All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to second you on, on Israel-Palestine. I, I agree with you completely. But, but I, I, I don't think we should talk about the Middle East in the United States right now. If, you, if you're in Tripoli, our, our, the view of the United States across Libya is higher than we could have possibly imagined. I mean, there are people reporting that they get, get, they get hugged. There are, are people reporting about how new, the Libyan oil ministers or the people who will be in charge are now looking deliberately to NATO right, and turning their backs on the Chinese and the Russians. I mean, th th in that country, the, the view is very different. I would say the view in Egypt is a lot higher than it would have been had the administration not shifted ground pretty quickly, learning on the fly, and actually call for Mubarak to go. And in Syria and in Bahrain, maybe it's not important, but it seems to me, just monitoring social media and regular media, there's a constant refrain, how come you're so inconsistent? Why are you taking the position you took in Libya and in Egypt and not in Bahrain? So there is a view on the part of the people protesting that what the U.S. and the people on the streets, what the U.S. does, does matter. And I'm not going to grade the, the administration. I, mean, I save my grades for my Princeton students uh, these days. Uh, but I do think we should recognize nobody predicts this. It's, un it's unrolled at a speed and in a dimension that no one was prepared for. And the administration has been willing to change and to adapt as it goes. So there's a lot we might point to that might, we might disagree with. But I would say overall, they managed to shift gears in Egypt to do the right thing in Libya, to push much harder on Syria. We were the ones pushing for sanctions last night. We didn't veto uh, that resolution. Uh, and I think it's in a far better place than it could have otherwise been. Well, the administration now has sort of settled on this, while well, our long-term vision for the region won't always meet up with our short-term goals. That very different policy, when you're talking about Bahrain, when you're talking about Syria, when you're talking about Libya, is that going to have a long-term impact on U.S. standing in the region? I think it depends country by country. And, and on Bahrain, I would like to see much more pressure on Bahrain, but I would come back to what Marwan said about the role of Saudi Arabia. The role of Saudi Arabia was important in Libya in the sense that they were willing to support the Arab League resolution, and if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't have been able to actually take the action we took. It's, the role of Saudi Arabia is going to be very important in, in Syria, as Marwan just said. Well. You know, if you're, if you're having to negotiate with Saudi Arabia and you know where Saudi Arabia stands on Bahrain, foreign policy is about having to make tough choices. That's not good for us in Bahrain, but it's a much more complicated picture. Go ahead. I mean, the only thing I'd note is, I mean, it really puts the question of U.S. values to the test. Um, the kind of thing that's happening in terms of the transparency and the, the inability to suppress information and the ability for people to see what's going on is the natural enemy of authoritarianism. So we should, as a country, based on our, our general value system, find that favorable over time because we are, generally speaking, not uh, associated with authoritarianism. You have short-term issues or particular issues about oil or about resources or other issues, but in broad terms, 
um, the, uh, the, the changes that are occurring to the extent that they, uh, they open up a world which is, which is more hostile to authoritarianism, we should be able to find a way to connect very well with that. Last question for you, because these are very quick panels. The Arab street is now a factor, but is it a factor that the Obama administration, that any Washington future administration is going to have to figure into the discussion, into the debate? Is it going to shift U.S. policy? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of talk that when the people have more of a voice in Egypt, there will be an impact on the Israeli relationship. Is that part of the discussion now? Is it being factored in? And if you could all weigh in on this. Well, I hope it is factored in. It should be factored in. I don't know is that it? it is being factored in. Uh, you talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict. You're going to see an Arab street which will be increasingly more critical of the Israeli occupation. And as a result, Arab governments, as they make the transition, certainly in Egypt, but in other places as well, where they also will be increasingly critical of the Israeli occupation as a response to their own public. And so uh, you are going to see uh, a shift uh, in, 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 in opinions in the Arab world that needs to be factored in in Washington. Uh, I think you will see other Arab countries where uprisings have not taken place, uh, where I believe the United States can play uh, a role in, uh, in urging these countries to accelerate the pace of reform. Uh, so that we don't end up with an Arab street in other Arab countries, much like what we have seen, uh, what we have seen in in Egypt and and elsewhere. The, the 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 key question, in my view, today for Arab governments is: the Arab street was not a factor in their policy making in the in the past. The 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 option was: let's do nothing because no one is complaining about it. Now that option is gone. Now Arab governments have only two options. Either they lead a reform process and a sustained and serious one from above that does not result in chaos and does not result in you know, shocks to the system, or they let the street lead it. But to, to sit and do nothing is no longer an option. To the extent that you know, the United States can work with Arab governments to do this, I think would be very beneficial to both uh, to both the U.S. and uh, to the region. I'm very concerned, for example, about the Saudi-U.S. Uh, relationship right now. It is an, a, now a complicated relationship. When the issues were terrorism and, uh, and oil, uh, things were fine uh, and, and lots of cooperation. Now there is major disagreement over what is happening with the Arab uprisings and, frankly, a, a growing disagreement with what is happening in the peace process. But I don't see either the Saudis or the Americans sitting down at a high level and discussing these in an open way to find solutions uh, to this problem. Anne-Marie, you also wanted to point out that the administration could, sh could learn some lessons from what we saw in the Middle East to what's happening now on Wall Street. You see a connection. Oh. I was sitting there thinking about the Arab street. I, I, so yes, I, I, I actually do, th I, that's a good thing to leave. I think there is a real connection between what we're seeing. It's not just Occupy Wall Street. If you're watching, it's Atlanta, it's Seattle, uh, it, it's Chicago. This is a movement that is growing and I predict will continue to grow for some of the same reasons. Obviously, we are not Egypt, we're not Libya, we're not Syria, we are a democracy. But the people behind these movements Movements, and I urge everybody here to go to We Are the 99%. Those, the people on that website are people you know. They are people who played by the rules. They're students who, who paid their loans and can't get a job. They're people who tried to pay their mortgage and couldn't. They are people who are basically saying our political system has failed us. We are humiliated, we are invisible, and the only way to get some kind of redress is to take to the streets. Now that is similar to the idea of movements that move beyond the political system. We should pay attention to some of those dynamics because we're going to see some of them. I'm not talking about armed insurrection or anything like it, but we're going to see some of that right here. And Steve, the lessons from the Arab Spring that the media, that will change the media, if you would, real quick, because I'm getting the eye. 
Well, it's, it's, the way we, it's the way we now in the mainstream media need to interact with social media and citizen journalism. So uh, we have a slightly different role. So we look at the video coming in uh, from the street. We try to authenticate it. We try to understand what it is. But then we disseminate it. So we are now becoming partners, really, with social media and citizen journalism. And there is a global community of people out there, just to go to Anne Marie's point, that is a, that is a, it's a generational and a technological change. And it's going to have a big impact on things all around the world, and it's more sophisticated and more nuanced than I think the older generation had understood it to be. And especially if your journalists are like our journalists, we just can't get into these countries unless you sneak in, and then that's always very dangerous. Well, thank you all very much for this. And coming up next, thank you.